Not seeing the wood for the trees is a sort of selective blindness. We all understand because we all suffer from it at times. Here in these islands, we are surrounded by trees, trees of a sort anyway, but that too often go unseen, unseen especially and shamefully by those that claim to lead. Unremarked are the trees I'm talking about, ignored are the trees I'm talking about, disregarded as though they were of no value, worst of all, overlooked as though they weren't even there. But the trees, the trees I'm talking about are there all right. The trees I'm talking about are the people, real people. Every day, some of those people, those real people, stop me to talk. For a few minutes, we talk together about some of what we think is wrong with Britain and the wider world. The people I talk to know what's wrong all around them without having to be told. It's called common sense, often in tones of the utmost frustration and disbelief at what they see all around them. They're people with families, people with jobs, people with a sense of responsibility who know what's what who know what's right. Most of those folk are the sort that keep the world moving forward, the sort that make things, fix things, deliver things, that do the things everyone counts on every day. They happen to be the sort of people I've always lived among, my fellow travellers, people who understand me and that I understand in return instinctively without having to think about it. When I was working in South Africa a lot of years ago now, good people there were in the habit of describing anyone straightforward, sensible and useful as an oak. I don't know if they still do that, but at the time it struck me as meaningful. It also made me think about how back here in the old country of Britain, we've learned to say that nearly all the oak trees are gone, which is true that our ancestors cut them down to build houses, to build the ships of Nelson's Navy, all of that. It's true that all of that shipbuilding and house building changed the landscape of Britain, that the old oak trees are thin on the ground. But still, the oak tree is synonymous with Britain and with what it means to be British. Hearts of oak, we say, of the best of our kind. The oak tree is slow grown, long lived, a thousand year lifespan for each one. Strong, resilient, a protector of all that lives in its shadow. Long ago, people learned to admire the oak. Druids paid them special attention, to say the least. Druid is an old word that means something like the people that know the oak trees. Long ago, our ancestors cut down most of the oak trees. That much is true. But also true is that oak trees are all around us yet in another form. The oak trees I'm talking about are those people I mentioned before that do things, build and make things, fix things, that do the things we count on every day. They're also the people that get on about their business without asking for any help. They don't need help and they don't want interference. They certainly don't want or willingly tolerate interference from people in authority who know nothing about nothing. What breaks my heart is that the powers that be completely disregard, ignore and dismiss those people, those oaks. If the powers that be see those people at all, then they count them as less than nothing, surplus to requirements. Indeed, if they notice them now, it's to disparage them, call them names, Little Englanders, fascists, white supremacists, nationalists, white van man. This disregarding of an entire class of people, people who just want to work to build better lives for themselves and their families, is a disgrace. In America, Hillary Clinton dismissed them as a basket of deplorables, by which she meant anyone who didn't agree with her. Justin Trudeau of Canada described people that wouldn't take the so-called vaccines as racists and misogynists. He called the truckers far right, seized their bank accounts. Peaceful protesters were jailed. Farmers standing in the face of attempts to take their land to end generations of food production and others like them all across Europe are vilified as far right extremists. Protests against lockdown by the sort of real people I'm talking about were ignored, ridiculed, violence was meted out upon them. That this happened disgusts me. More and more the policies, the policies being pursued in the West are revealed as simply anti-human. What do most people want after all? A home of their own, a family, a job, peace to get on with it. Also peace in the world. Most people in the world want peace. Instead, what do they get? They get needled incessantly about things that are no business of the authorities. Those authorities come after people's cars, the way people can heat their homes. People are needled about the food they eat. At school, their children are taught that mum and dad might not be the people to listen to about much of anything and certainly not about such matters as whether they should be content with the bodies they were born in, the names they were given. The anti-human agenda tells people, people who just want to be left alone to work and raise families unmolested, 
that they are to blame for the imminent ending of life on Earth. The anti-human agenda tells hard-working people to pay no attention to decay in the homeland, to failing infrastructure, breathtaking price rises on food and fuel and every other damned thing, to systemic corruption in the institutions, in the banks, to failing standards of education. Ignore all that, those people are told, and watch us send billions of pounds to corrupt nations thousands of miles away for pointless, endless wars. Ignore that you don't feel safe at home. Ignore the potholes on the roads. Ignore all that, those people are told. And if anyone raises their voice to object, they have their noses rubbed in the fact there's not a damn thing they can do about it. What breaks my heart is that those people, descendants of hundreds of generations of others like them, deeply rooted in the soil of this place, are overlooked as though they don't matter, as though they never mattered, as though they have nothing to give, as though this country and the world would be better off without them. They're even ridiculed for that sense of belonging, that sense of place. The anti-humanists want to take an axe to all of that, to cut everyone everywhere away from their roots, so that they feel disconnected, belonging nowhere, and therefore anywhere, rootless as tumbleweed. It's one of the oldest tricks in the book, this cutting of the roots of people. Every religion, every ideology, every leader of a popular movement has employed it, and it works every time. This behaviour by the latest ideologues and authoritarians is as deliberate as it is cynical. They wield the axe to separate us one from another, to cleave us into smaller and smaller groups, so that all the little groups might be set at each other's throats, whether it's on the grounds of race or religion, anything to stoke the fire. All the heat, all the anger is between groups when it should simply be all of us against the few of them. We don't even have to like each other while we deal with them. My enemy's enemy is my friend, remember, and all of us have a common foe. The solution for everyone begins with seeing that it's happening, all this division, all this driving of hatred and fear, and it's being done on purpose by the only ones who ever profit and benefit from the resultant chaos, which is the few. Where is the leader who will notice, far less care, what might be built of such a forest of oaks? There are towering oaks all around us, and any leader could receive no greater honour in this life than to have the respect of those people. Those people are still here, long after most of the oak trees felled long ago, and someone with the wit could stand within, alongside those oaks, and make something unbeatable. It's an open goal we have before us. Parliament's rotten. The institutions are rotten. The judiciary, the civil service, the media, rotten. The fiat currencies are Ponzi schemes. Rotten. All of it. The whole damned system. The whole damned state is rotten. Anyone with a mind to could knock it all down. It's an open goal and anyone with half a mind could enlist those people that make and fix and do, empower them and have them dig out all the decay and set about the straightforward, easier work of building something new, something fresh and something clean. Here's the thing. This anti-human these anti-human authorities are powerless in the face of the many, but only when the many realise and accept that they're being played yet again by the few, provoked into fighting each other when all that anger might usefully be pointed not from side to side at the neighbours, but upwards to where all the evil lies, where all the trouble in the world comes from. In spite of all I've just been talking about, in spite of all the fear porn, all the censorship, the deliberate and cynical conjuring into being of one war after another, one scandemic after another, one existential crisis after another, in spite of all that. Frankly, I honestly think because of all that, the many are finally believing less and less of what they're told. In fact, the Oaks believe none of it. That will be our strength. That is how we will prevail, together, in the face of the axe being wielded against us. I'm joined tonight by presenter Jasmine Burtles. Hello, Jasmine. Hello, Beth. Always good to have you here. Thank you. To share the hours. Yeah. Um, it, as I said, it, it breaks my heart mm. that the people, mm. the good people, are just ignored. Totally. Where is the leader that will recognise the people for what they are and what they're capable of? Well, any, any leader that's doing that is, is now being branded a far-right extremist, dangerous, someone like Gert Wilders, someone like Robert Fico in Slovakia, who has just been shot, as we know. And it is truly shocking that our media, few media certainly in the UK, had kind of basically said, well, you know, 
he asked for it. He's, he's too right wing. He was against the Ukraine war. He was against lockdowns, things like that. You know, and so that is essentially the, the, what, what they're saying. And it also, also he spoke about the WHO mm -hmm. and the, yes. the changes to the international health regulations and so on and so on, and pointed out what ought to be glaringly obvious to everyone by now, yeah. that that's a power grab by unelected, unaccountable Centralists. Yes, where have we heard that before? Extraordinary, isn't it? It seems to keep happening all over the place. And, you know, as you were talking about, about the, the oaks, the, the trees around us, I, I was also thinking um, how ironic it is that those, I wouldn't say environmentalists, I would say political environmentalists, those who've greenwashed themselves and, and are pretending that what they're doing is, is for our good, you know, the, the e ecological good, they hate trees. Yeah, I mean, any time you have these sort of political environmentalists, you know, they get power. They cut down all the trees. You know, they did it in Plymouth. You remember that? And also, they seem to hate flora and fauna generally. I mean, now in this country, incredibly, if you happen to have chickens in your back garden, which is something, I, if I had a back garden, I'd have them, you have to register them. And now I just put something on my Twitter about New Zealand. The New Zealand government is forcing that they're burning bee boxes. What hives? What hives? Exactly. They're burning hives because they say, oh, they've got mites. That is not a reason to burn them. I, I, I don't get it, but there, there really seems to be an assault from the so-called ecologically friendly um, leaders that we have across the world. You're right. That Agenda 2030, or whatever you want to call it, mm. which sells itself as, as caring for yeah. a, a sustainable future, the planet, and all life upon it, seems uh, quite the opposite, mm. quite the contrary, to care about nothing and to care about people least of all. Yes, and, and I mean, hence the, the hatred of farmers. You know, again, um, somebody, who, one of my Twitter followers said that in, um, in India, the, the farmers there are being absolutely hammered. We've seen what's been happening in Europe. Gert Wilders, as far as I can see, has, has come into power on the back of the anger of, of the Dutch farmers. Farmers in this country are, are on their knees pretty much, but they're, they're getting together now. And, and there is this extraordinary um, hatred of farming, um, of cows. Cows have been vilified. Cows, for goodness sake. And it, it's a weird thing that wh wherever you have these political ecologists, political environmentalists. Um, they, they get rid of trees, they, they'll get rid of fields and put metal and glass, you know, that are, um, you, you'll have the sort of solar panels, but they seem to hate places where you've got, you know, the, the usual sort of bucolic scene that we've grown up with, with nice sheep and cows. And which is why it seems absolutely obvious to me that were there to be a leader who would these people are waiting. Yeah. The people that yeah. understand all of this, mm -hmm. that, that, mm -hmm. a, that appreciate the landscape, that yeah. know how to care for it, that know how to build and make and fix. They just need one person, mm -hmm. one yeah. person yes. to let them go, yes. in a sense. Yes. Not even to lead, just to stand within them and let them get on with that which, that, what it is that they do. True. I, I think uh, they, these people exist, but the, the, the level of courage that it takes to be that person and to stand against all the establishments, against academia particularly, against media, against the civil service, all of which are railed against and, and backed, of course, by, by the WHO and, and the, the WEF and the UN, all that sort of thing. They are railed against any sort of individualism, any sort of, uh, sort of support of the people that you've been talking about, those hearts of oak. And it's just the people. It's just the people need mm. to be let loose.